رجل عالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم نوى التعلم والتعليم والذكر والتذكر ونفع والانتفاع والإفادة والاستفادة والحتى مسك في كتاب الله وسنة رسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم ودعاء إلى الهدى ودلالة على الخير اتغاء وجه الله ومرضاته وقربه وثوابه سبحانه وتعالى مع لطف وعافية برحمتك يا أرحم الراحم اللهم إن نسألك علم الدين والسوفي هاني وهب يغاني اللهم إن نسألك علم الدين ومشب السوفي هاني وهب يغاني اللهم إن نسألك علم الدين والسوفي هاني وهب يغاني صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارك وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله Alright, Alhamdulillah, uh, we're continuing our lesson. Right, before we continue, we just mentioned a few things about Rajab that's coming up. Right, so I'm not sure, I think Singapore is tomorrow night, kan? not tonight. Right, I know like some place is tonight, but I think in Singapore is tomorrow night, right, Rajab. Right, so, uh, and it's, it's the way lah, that uh, whenever, whenever a special month comes our way, right, we always spend a bit of time during the lesson, we speak about the month. Right, and then just to uh, urge people on, right, to to to, to do more uh, good deeds in this month of Rajab. Right, so Rajab is one of the Haram months. Right, there are four Haram months in Islam. Right, so you have uh, Shawwal, you have uh, you have Muslim Muhammad, Shawwal, Zulqaida. Uh, this four months together, right? Shawwal, Shawwal, Zulqaida, Zulhijjah, Muharram. Right, the four months that come together, and then you have uh, Rajab by itself. Right, so. Yeah, correct. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we have Rajab by itself, right? Rajab is basically so basically the months that are together, right? They are haram months. Haram meaning that you cannot fight in those months in the in the past, right? They're not able to fight. Not not allowed to fight in those months because people are going for Hajj, right? Because Hajj is a hijjah, so people are actually traveling to go for Hajj, right? So it uh so it's three months together lah. Is Zulhijjah, Zulqaida, and uh, Muharram, right? Not Shawwal. Shawwal is not part of it, right? Three months that are together: Zulkaida, Zulhijjah, Muharram, right? Uh, so because people are going for Hajj, they coming back from Hajj, right? Rajab is by itself as a haram month because it is a month that people in the past used to go for Umrah, right? They would aim Rajab to go for Umrah, right? So because people are going for Hajj and for Umrah for pilgrimage, so it is made among the Arabs that nobody is to fight in these months, right? To make the the the, the path safe, lah. Right, for the Arabs to go, right? But in Islam, right, haram months they weigh uh, heavy for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right, every deed is multiplied tremendously right, in the haram months. Right, so every good deed is multiplied, you know, uh, up to seventy thousand times right, in haram months. Right, so it is encouraged right to fast. Right, if you can fast, fast in the haram months. Right, so Rajab first of Rajab will be on a Monday. So those who can fast, fast. Right, fast on the Monday. Right, in Haram months, it is uh, also recommended to fast uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday in one go. That right, means fast in one go. Right, if you're able to do it every week, you can do it. Right, there is there are, there are narrations about the the rewards of that, but right now it's not coming to me. Right, but how many thousand years of, of reward and whatsoever lah. Right, so basically, you know, if you can fast, right, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, right, in one go for Rajab months. Right, and then every night, uh, there are recitations that you can recite. Right, especially because Rajab is basically a month of, uh, of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, whereby we turn back to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and we seek Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala's forgiveness, right, for all that we have done. Right, so because before we go into Ramadan. Right, because Ramadan right is a month of uh, of reaping your uh, as as much as you can from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right, so you have Rajab right is a month of cleansing. Right, so you have your you have your your your, your field your land right whereby you have to is basically you have this land right that is full of you know filth. Right, this land is your heart. Right, your heart throughout the year. Right, so basically these three months Rajab Shabbat Ramadan it is like a refresher, right before you begin the year. Uh, again thereafter right so throughout the year you've been like doing all kinds of things and you're like you know you're, you're falling back your your face is becoming weaker and whatsoever right things are happening to you throughout the year right so when rajab comes right you're going to come towards ramadan right so the muslims they begin to prepare for ramadan right uh, at very least at rajab but of course they prepare for way before that lah for ramadan 
So Rajab, you are clearing this heart, this heart of yours, this land of yours, at least this tilth that you have, right? So by first istighfar, 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 istighfar. It's like you weeding your land, and removing the weeds, and removing all the the, the the filth and the dirt and whatsoever. You're removing it. You're clearing the land. Right? In Sha'ban, Sha'ban is the month of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is called the month of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam because it is the month whereby the ayat, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Right, that ayat was revealed in Sha'ban Right, so when that ayat Because the ayat was revealed in Sha'ban And that ayat is the ayat of Salawat Right, basically uh, The ayat says that For sure the Allah and the, and, the, and, the, and the angels They send their salutation unto, unto, unto the Prophet So all you who believe Send your salutations And your uh, prayers unto him Right, so that was the ayat That was sent down So the whole of Sha'ban We focus on Salawat Right, slawat, 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 the whole of Sha'ban. Right, so the whole of Rajab is all istighfar. That means you're cleansing it. Right, the month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The whole of Sha'ban, right, it is the month of watering. Right, you're watering the pla- uh, your, your, your land right, for it to grow. Right, then in Ram- Ramadan comes, you will be more than prepared. Uh, you'll, be, you'll, be, inshallah, you'll be prepared to uh, face Ramadan and to reap as much as you can from Ramadan. Right, so it is it's basically a, a focus lah. Like a focus, so they always mention this before every every sacred month, right? Uh, the in a hadith it is mentioned that five nights in the year are whereby doa sa mustajab, 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 right? So the five what are the five nights? They are the first night of Rajab, right? The middle night of Sha'ban, right? This of Sha'ban. So we all you know we all know about this for Sha'ban, right? But the first of Rajab, the awal Rajab, right? In 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 Hadramaut, right? They would they would actually gather. On the first uh, day, night of Rajab And they will actually do recitations On the first night of Rajab Like how we do it on Nisa Sha'ban right? But we don't do it for the first night of Rajab eh? We should do it right? On the first night we gather in the mosque Maybe they do right? Some mosques they do, they do do it right? They gather on the first night of Rajab And they do, do have the recitations uh, for Rajab right? There is a you, know, you can do any, any, any kind of uh, istighfar for Rajab But there are those that are specifically uh, mentioned You can go and look like, on Mosala website They will have like, all the things that you can see in Rajab Right. Uh, so first of Rajab, middle of Sha'ban, the two nights of Hari Raya, and the two nights of Eid. Right, the nights before Eid, eh? Right, and then the night before Fridays. That means every week, right? Every Thursday night. So there are the five nights whereby your whereby duas are not rejected by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Right, and Sayyidina Ali said that whosoever uh, brings to life these five nights, Allah will bring to life their heart on the day whereby all hearts die. And Allah will bring to life their heart on the day where hearts die. Right, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on these five nights, right? So, 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 so the scholars say, okay, how do you bring these nights to life? Right, do you have to spend the whole night in prayer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So they say that the minimum right, as to what you can do on this night, the minimum eh, as to what you can do on these nights is that you pray your Aisha. In jama'ah And you pray your subuh In jama'ah right? Because praying Isha In jama'ah Will equal to Half the night uh, Being Half the night of prayer And praying subuh In jama'ah It will be equal to A full night of prayer right? So at the very least If you want to be counted As someone who brought life To the night At least you need to be Praying your Isha And your subuh In jama'ah right? Then you'll be counted As somebody who brought life to the night right? But of course In Hadramaut like, They would actually uh, You know They would do more than that right? They would read their Quran They would do a khatam In one night right? They would have their You know 5,000 or 7,000 Or 10,000 istighfar They would do in the night right? They would do all kinds of You know uh, Worship right? And they would not sleep the night and they will not sleep the night, right? So the night is basically they are awake the entire night, right? So there, I know I know of those who will read like forty one years since throughout the whole night, right? Basically they will do you know a lot of worship, right? In uh in in welcoming Rajab, right? So so you know for us to, you know, and also in Rajab we know um the the blessed event of Isra al Mi'raj happened. Right, so which is why you know it is a it's a, it's a, it's a month of Allah subhanahu wa taala because that is when the Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam went into the presence of Allah subhanahu wa taala in the highest heavens. Right, so of course you know uh, and we're in we're in our 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 classes of bringing up children and one thing that Habib Ali you know Habib Ali Habib Abu Bakr Adani right he said you know and he teach, and his one of his students is my teacher. Right, she said that you know one thing that we need to be doing is to be bringing attention to these months to our children. 
I need to know the importance of all this month. It's not just Hari Raya that is important, you know. Like they must know the importance of Ramadan. Because Ramadan, inshallah, we're showing them the importance of it. Right? But there are other months, right? And, and in fact, uh, Habib Abu Bakr Adadi, he has a book that writes about the events in every month, right? Important events that happen in every month, right? Jamal al Akhir uh, just, just passed us by, right? And that was the month that Fatima Zahra was born, right? And then you have now uh, Rajab. So Rajab, the, the, of the biggest event in Rajab is. Uh, basically the Israel and Miraj, right? So basically, you know, have a like have 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 events in the house, have celebration in the house, talk about the story, act out about the story, you know, make it make it life, make it alive, like bring it alive for your children. Then when it comes to Shaaban, right? Shaaban is a preparation for Ramadan, right? And of course, you know, if you can, right? If you, I mean, if like, cause our culture, we celebrate Shawwal. Right in other cultures, you don't celebrate Shawwal that much. Right, we celebrate Shawwal, like, you know, one party, one whole month of partying. Eh? Right, but other people they they celebrate um, Zulhijjah, which actually makes more sense, you know, because Zulhijjah, like you have the the, the days of Tashriq, three days, but it's haram to fast. Right, I mean, it makes more sense to go and party then. <laughs> but in Shawwal, the first six days is muakkada to fast, <laughs> and the second day to the seventh day. Right, of Shawa is muakkada, eh? muakkada. It means muakkada to fast, right? but even more muakkada. It means even more emphasized to do it immediately, right? To break your nafs. Right? It means you finish Ramadan, you take one day break, and you go right into it on the second of Shawal. Right? But for us, it's like you know, impossible, impossible because we have like how many open house invitations and like like, like we all like, having going all the way around <laughs> wrong, <laughs> wrong about it. Tashrik is meant to be haram to fast because that's a day of celebration. Three days Tashrik. Right, plus Hari Raya, four days. You have four days of, of haram fasting so everybody can celebrate. So Islam has done this for us but we took the other, we took the other one. <laughs> right, because we are just more happy that Ramadan finished. <laughs> so we are celebrating Shawal all, all, the whole year, the whole month, you know. Only in this part of the world. Right? Other parts of the world, no. <laughs> Only in our part of the world we have this uh, you know, situation going on. Right, but uh, what's your name, Muhammad? Yeah, so, so basically to, to, to emphasize to them the importance of months, right? So Rajab, so go back home today, you know, talk to your kids about Rajab, like the importance of Rajab. You can find so many articles online. Muasala has so many articles on the importance of Rajab and they have a sedekah, you know, going on in Rajab and then more Quran in Rajab. More, basically, you know, celebrate Rajab, right? It's a month of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? You can learn, you know, you can maybe put into place, you know, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every day because it's the month of Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala So the names of Allah um, The sifat of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala Every day a new story right, On the names of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala You know like, like it's just, you, you, could, you could do that right, You can make up stories right? So you know, Al-Basir so You can say you know, One day Ali He went here and was there. So Al-Basir, Allah is Al-Basir Allah saw him Allah knows what he did right? You know we can make up stories right? If every name of Allah Subhanahu Allah is Al-Adil Al-Adil right? The one who is Who is fair You know Allah is al, uh, you know, Al-Aziz Al-Jabbar right? Can you go into the names of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala And you can make stories from them So that the kids appreciate Allah Subhanahu's names more right? Rather than them just It is important that they memorize the names as, in, as part of a song right? But it is more um, They will appreciate it more right? If we could just do it uh, In a story form right? Each name is Any story lah Just, just be creative about it lah eh? Right, uh, and inshallah, inshallah, may Allah make it easy for us. Right, so that's about Rajab. Right, uh, doa musajab eh, uh, tomorrow night. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. Do not let it go. Uh, the istighfar of Rajab, you can find it online. If I will put it on my Facebook lah, if you want to find it. Right, inshallah. All right, so we are going, we are continuing, right? And now we are actually, because we went into Tamiz, right? And with Tamiz, right, we are actually coming now into habits. Right, because at Tamiz, the child is now he's able to understand things. He's able to discern. Like the age of discernment is called Tamiz. Right, so he's able to understand, he's able to discern. Right, we have, we have we're in Tamiz, right? Yeah, correct. Right, we're in Tamiz. <laughs> right, he's able to discern. And now it's a time whereby you are instilling habits. Right, from before, you're trying to instill habits. Right, but you know, the child is still not able to discern. So he's able to copy Right, but he's no idea what he's doing and why he's doing it and whatsoever. They just know what the mother says and it's follow whatever you do. Right, but now it's time whereby they're able to they're able to appreciate. Right? And from there comes knowledge. So remember, we have our four things whereby we um, we we preserve in our children. Right, your emotional, your intellectual, your physical, and your spiritual. Right, at Tamiz, because the mind is now bright and light is now shining on the mind. Right, at Tamiz, that is when the light of the intellect is shining. Right, so you're going to grab this intellect and you're going to, you know, give it the, the highest the highest of what you can give this intellect. Right. So here he says, and I'll read the lines, right, inshallah. 
وراحت السبيان بعد المكتب أن يأذن الولي له باللعب فإنه عند الصبا محبوب وقلبه أيضا به يطيب وكثة التعليم موت القلب ويذهب الذكاء وبعد اللؤب فيطلبون للخلاص الحيلة تنجي من التعليم أو وسيلة فالرفق في كل الأمور أحسن قالوا بذا وصرحوا أو بيّنوا Right, so here, before this, right, so now he says when, 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 the, when the light of Tamiz comes, right, and he says the light of Tamiz comes, the first thing you will see is that they begin to show shyness. And this shyness is a light and a gift from God. Right, before Tamiz, they might not show shyness with their private parts, and with their whatever. They, they might have some, right, with some people, right, but with their parents, they might not have no shyness. Right? They might not have any shyness. But when Tamiz comes, it becomes very obvious, this shyness in them. They don't want to show you know, parts of their body in front of even their own parents. And they become very shy. And he says here to preserve this. Right? Preserve the shyness that is in them. Right? Preserve the light of shyness. And then, and then now, with this mind that you have, right? this is new, fresh mind that is now you know, able to understand what's going on around him, you are going to occupy this mind with the Quran. Right, because when the mind is occupied with the Quran, it will expand. Right, beyond you know, because beyond everything, it will expand. Right, and you know, Subhanallah, I was reading this person's uh, I don't know blog or something. Right, whereby you know she focused on the child memorizing the Quran before Tamiz, which is fine. Right, you can do it by talqin. Right, you read and he read and he recites and he read and he recites. But after Tamiz, she stopped. Right, stopped completely because now is the time for secular education. Uh, they go into primary one, they go into primary two. Right? So the Quran is stopped. You know, unfortunately, the Quran is stopped. Uh, whereas at the point of time, is whatever you have memorized, now is the time for me to explain it to you. Right? Now is the time for me to actually go deeper into it. Right? When they are not Tamis, you can go like very kiddie, you know, in the way you explain the Quran. But now with Tamis, you can go deeper into names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can go deeper into how you connect them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And we mentioned before that uh, the biggest, you know, uh, fault right, in our modern day, in our modern day, um, Parenting right, is that we fail to connect our kids to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right, we, we, we implement on them right, the sharia without the connection. Right, and that is why they leave the sharia very easily. Right, because it's not, there's no focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first seven years already there is a focus on connecting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At seven onwards, at Tamiz, and Tamiz from five to seven. Right, at this point onwards especially, you are going to focus more and more and more speech from yourself and from them. You're going to be prompting them. Right, more to see how they are understanding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and their worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see this entire course, I'm not going to talk a lot or in fact at all about your academic studies or about like whatever because you can do whatever you want to do. Right? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not go to school. Right? So whether or not you go to school or you don't go to school, what school you want to choose and whatsoever, that is up to you to decide. Right? But what is compulsory on you as parents, right? as, as, God, as, as trustees right? over these human beings who have come into your life, Right, and that's what your children are. Your children are basically trustees. Right? You, they are human beings right, who are placed in this earth. Right? And their, their point in this earth is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You happen to be the adult that is over them. You happen to be that adult. Right? So you are a trustee over them right, for, to prepare them for the life of this world. Right? That is what you are. Right? So you, you don't, you don't, you don't actually, they don't belong to you. They belong to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they will answer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, What are you? You are a trustee. And that's all you are, you are a trustee. So understand that as a trustee, right, we are focusing them on what? Their role in this world. Right? What is their role in this world? Worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which is why, you know, whatever they want to be in life, let them be. Right? As long as it is, you know, uh, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it's fine. Right? Whatever they want to be, let them be. Right? So, 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 so what is on you right, is to focus them on... Yeah, I know, I know, I know it's okay. What is on you is to focus them on Allah subhanahu on, on worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at Tamiz, right, so he says here, right, so we're going back to a bit, eh? So he says, فَلْيُزِمُهُ دَلْسَ لِلْقُرْآنِ فَإِنَّهُ عِلْمٌ عَظِيمُ الشَّانِ right? It is of the greatest of knowledges, right, to focus them on the Qur'an. Not just reciting, right, because, you know, now you're going to make them read, read the Qur'an more, right, but you are going to have to uh, exp- explain to them the Qur'an. I have somebody who is passionately, you know, uh, in love with the Quran. I have to explain to them. Right? That is important. If not you, right? You have to be doing this, right? And so now, if you have young children right now, then you better be, you know, picking it up, 
Right? You better be, be learning your Quran right? for you to be able to bring the Quran to your children. All right. So, so the Dars al Quran, yani, you, what you have, what, what it is, is that, and Imam Ghazali mentions this, right, is that, you know, it is, uh, it is, it is to occupy the child so much, right, the Quran, that he has no time to think about other things, right, in a way. But he's so occupied with the Quran, in the knowledge in the Quran. And the Quran has all kinds of knowledges, eh? right? of stories, of science, of, of, of language, of, of, uh, of, of whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says of the next world. Right? There's a lot of things where you can occupy your child, uh, child with, with the Quran. Right? So for, for us to put aside uh, an amount of time, and in fact a large amount of time every day, right? focusing them on the Quran. Right? That is the most important thing to you, for you in your life. Right? Because Rasulullah Sallam says in the hadith, right, teach your children or, or train your children on three things. Right? Love of me, love of my family and the reading of the Quran. Right? So reading of the Quran, that means you have to go deep into the Quran. Right? To know about the Quran. Because at the, end of, at the end of the day, we are at the end of time. We are in the end of times. And Rasulullah Sallam said that you know, it will be darkness over darkness over darkness at the end of times. Right? And the only thing, and the Sahabas asked, Ya Rasulullah, what's the way out? And Rasulullah Sallam said that the way out is the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the way out. So if you want them to be saved, right, in, and we're living in a non-Muslim country, right? so it is a country whereby there is all kinds of influences. And like, I mean, we get scared. Lah. You see what's going on in our country, we get scared. Right? But, but don't be scared. It's easy. Right? The affair is very easy. It's very simple. Right? The affair is basically... Let them hold on to the Quran. Right? It's, it's all there. Right? Rasul Sam has it's all there. Right? There's not much we have to think about. Right? It's all uh, if available, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will preserve them. So here, right, after he speaks in depth, and we went into we went into this in our previous class, right, about, about the Quran and knowledge in the Quran and whatsoever, and how we can bring the Quran to our children, right? And I think that now there are more and more publications right, on tafsir for children. I think there are more, it's growing. Alhamdulillah, it is growing. People are going into this, right? In fact, you know, because the tafsir uh, for English language uh, is something that is lacking. Uh, it's really, really lacking when it comes to tafsir in the English language. Right? So now they are, they, are, they are having people who are doing it. So Alhamdulillah, right? they are actually uh, producing more and more for parents to use. Right? And if, if possible, let, let, let it be that you are the one who is teaching your child right? about the Quran so that you both, you know, you, you progress in your journey with your love for the Quran. Right, and then so now he says, right, and now we go into habits, right, habits of the child uh, at Tamiz. So the first habit he mentions, right, is that you need to teach them how to play and rest. Right, so now at Tamiz, right, and this is, a, this is something that you know we have to emphasize as, as Singaporean parents, eh, right, they need you, your child needs to have time whereby they just play without it having to be educational. Right, I mean, just play, just go and play. Like, go and play rounders, go and play football, go and play something. I like just go and play. Like so he says, وَرَوْحَ تُسِبْيَانْ بَعْدَ الْمَكْتَبِي أَنْ يَأْذَنَ اللَّهُ وَأَنَأْذَنَ الْوَلِي لَهُمْ بِاللَّعِبِي Right, so the wali, uh, the parent, needs to allow the child to just go and, and be silly. Like be silly, go and play, have fun. Right, and every day this has to happen. Right, because this, this will basically strengthen the child in his worship. Right? And in, in, in some of the hadith where Rasulullah says that you, know, you need to refresh your, yourself. You need to play. You need to go out. Right? Right? You need to go out and play and refresh yourself right? so that you can come back and worship better. Right? Because if you stay on worship, right, you will, you know, it can cause a death in the heart, right? especially if you don't understand what's going on. Right? So you know, I, know, I know in the English book, the Shay does, you know, speak something about, about this, this, this situation, right? But basically what I took from uh, Hababa was that, was that what he means here is, is basically empty play. That means you don't have to make everything to be educational, you know, for your child, because the child, right? everything will going to be educational. No, let them be silly, let them go and play, play in sand, go and play in water, do nonsense, whatever, right? But don't, nothing that, is, that, that will harm them, lah. so video games out, lah, eh? Video games, try, try, try to th- throw it out, eh? video games, uh, all these things that are unnatural play, natural play. Uh, is the best. Right? Let them do all whatever, whatever they want to do. Right? Because he says here, right, that for surely this kind of play, this kind of like silliness or play, or even you can be silly with them. Right? And they like it. Right? They like it when you, uh, when, 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 when you joke and you play and you act also and you whatsoever. Like it's, it's, it's with just them. Right? It's, it's nice for the parent to born that way. Right? And then, you know, and, and I know Habib Thor here, the one who taught us this, uh, this poetic parenting, 
Like he would like Have like TV shows Like not TV shows But it's just like He would hold the camera Then he would like Interview his children And then he'd be like You know like Oh this is Aisha Like she is like The best uh, You know like like Organizer of blogs In the world And then like, he would like Interview her On how are your blogs today You know that kind of thing Like they, they would play With their kids lah They have, they have babes They have babes But they would play Right And I, when I was living With Zainab This past week Like, like you would see them You know Really lie on their children Right, really, you know, like the child likes this. They will go all out to find out about it, and then they will, they will play the child with this matter. Right, so the child likes horses. Okay, she knows all about horses. The child, you know, is obsessed with horses. Right, in a way, so it's in a sense like like let, let it be and let it play. Right, so don't be a parent that's so strict, right, so hostile, so you know, like boring whatsoever. Right, you need to be able to bring them out. Right and uh, and have this and he says here a very interesting point. Right, that Magazali um, actually points out that if you were to force them. Right, if you were to force them on, on studying, 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 or everything has to be, you know, uh, educational, you know, everything has to be educational whatsoever, you can lead to a death in the heart. Right, the heart can die. Right, because the heart needs to breathe. Right, so if you're forcing, 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 and this is what's going on. Right, when you're forcing your children on study, 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 and they have class after class after class after class after class, right, what happens is that they might come to a point right, whereby they just tune out. They tune out, they no longer feel the, the, the passion anymore. Right? And sometimes you, f- you do see people who like, have been on the religion or studying the religion for a very long time, right? they have tuned out. Right? They, don't, they don't feel the, the passion anymore of this religion. They don't feel the, the beauty, they don't see the beauty, they don't cry anymore. Right? And when you, don't, when you stop crying, right? when you read the Quran, that shows a death in the heart. The heart has died. Right, so you know the, 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 this is a very very clear sign now, and and it's a dangerous thing in a way that if you're bringing your child up on the religion, right, be very wary of this, right, because it can happen and it has happened many times. Right, people who are brought children who are brought up on the religion and they enter into religious schools and whatsoever, right, it can happen and it has happened many times. If you've seen people right, whereby they no long they detach from the religious sciences, right, and they don't taste it anymore. Right, it's become very bland for them. It's become, a, it's become an examinal subject. Right, it's for the exams. And they memorize it and they just tune it out. Right, so be very careful that it doesn't happen to your children. Right, let them always taste it. Right, by letting them play right, every now and then, play. Right, and then also having it casual. Right, so you learn in a very casual manner. It doesn't have to be you know, a desk at all times. Right, you can learn in a casual manner. You can let them you know, talk and, and express themselves. and whatsoever. My mother, when we were young, that was how she, was, she should educate us. Right, she would not, it would not, wouldn't just be, you know, always accessing books or like for us to, I mean like, actually I never, I don't remember my mother at all stressing anything on us. <laughs> right, you know, she would just, she would make us study, right, but she wouldn't like stress things, stress us out about anything. Right, she would just like, it would be very, very casual. Right, so you, we can actually discuss the situation or discuss why the answer correct or wrong. And like, like even up to now, you know, our WhatsApp group is all about like, you know, discussion on what, God knows what. Nah. <laughs> right, on like whatever signs or like grammar or whatever. <laughs> it's, not, it's like whatever lah. But it's, it's in a sense like, like, that's how, I don't know how she inculcated that. Right, but it is basically to find joy. Right, in studying because of a balance. It's a balance going on. Right, it's not something that you hate doing. Right, and if we did hate doing it, we would drop it very quickly, like Malay. <laughs> but Malay is, but I mean, even then, even then, she inculcated in us a, that there was the beauty in it, right? To us to appreciate the beauty in, in the in the poetry and whatsoever in all subjects, in all subjects, right? You can actually inculcate, you know, the love for it, right? But with the tarwih, that means tarwih, that means you have to, you have to 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 to, to, to breathe, you have to allow them to breathe, which is why. Not chasing syllabus is a very good thing. It's a very good thing. Right? Because when you see that they need to breathe, you pause for a while. Okay, breathe. Right? You pause for a while, you don't have to chase it. You don't have to chase the syllabus. Pause for a while, breathe. You know, and, uh, experience what you are learning. Right? You can take our time to experience what you are learning. Right? And then you can go on uh, thereafter. And if you can hold this, then hold it. Right? So that you can see their, their pace. Right? So here, you know, Imam Ghazali, uh, Muslim Muhammad, Right, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right, he said in a hadith, "Rawihun nufus, fa innaha ida ukthi ida ukrihat uh, istaasat." Right, so so Rasulullah sallallahu says in a hadith, you know, rest the self. The self needs to rest, right? Because for surely, if you keep forcing it, right, it will rebel. 
uh, it will rebel against you. And even like my Ustazah Zainab, she kept telling me that, you know, I need to, she was telling me personally lah, that I need to find time, right, whereby I just rest my, my, my own heart and my own mind. Right? Because when you give, 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 you will be bent out. Like you need to actually have time, even as, as, and especially as mothers, because right? you're always giving, 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 giving. Right? So it is it's important right? if you can find a period of time in your, in, in, in your day right? whereby you take. Right? You take you know, to rest your heart, to rest your mind. Right? And they will appreciate. Right? They, will, they will sense this from you and they will appreciate this from you that you are also rested. Right? So in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a good way. Lah. Right. So he says here, so فَكُسَ تُتَعْلِي مَوْتُ الْقَوْلِبِي وَيُزْهِبُ الذَّكَى وَبَعْدُ الْلُبِّي Right, it will, and, and too much studying will actually remove the intellect of a child. Right, I mean the sharpness of a child and the inner sight of a child will be killed right, by too much studying. Right, it's, it's, a, I mean, it's such deep insight, Imam Ghazali, subhanAllah. It's from Imam Ghazali, eh? It's very deep insight because, you know, it, it, there's, there's an importance in all of these things. It's just like muscle, right? When you, when you work, your, your brain is a muscle, eh? Your brain is a muscle. And if, you, if everyone has ever tried to memorize, you know, Quran and whatsoever, you know it's a muscle, right? Because when you try to memorize too much, you feel your brain is tired. Right? It's too, it can't even, nothing goes in anymore. And when you rest it by doing something else with the brain, and then you go back to memorization, it's faster. Is stronger, and in fact, it is a method in uh, in in education, whereby you memorize something for a while, you leave it, you go do something else with your brain, I mean something else, and you go back and you memorize it instead of sitting there for a few hours memorizing. Right? It's actually a better method. I can't remember what it's called. My brother was telling me about it. It's called like a lapse method or something like that. There's a method about it, whereby you can sharpen your your memory right, in, in doing it that way right, in fact the ulama when it comes to Quran also they will do it that way and tomorrow tomorrow so every day at the same time there will be Quran memorization right, if you would like to do that right, so Masayna Muhammad so see I forgot what I was saying okay, what Imam Ghazali is saying here right, that, that the, the rest of the brain right, the rest of the mind it is important right, to go and do things that are just without using the mind Right, this, 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 this to play right, because mautul qalbi, the, the death of the heart, it means that he is not able to, 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 to feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore. The death of the heart. And when he can't feel Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala anymore, that will cause him to go into doing things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dislikes, right, into sins. Right? That is called death of the heart. That's how you have people who could memorize the Quran. Because they spend all that time memorizing the Quran, but at the same time they lie and they cheat. Right? That's how that happens. Right? Because the, the Quran is memorized, but the heart has died. Right? So they go into you know and, and, you know, and they go into all kinds of uh, sins. Right? The death of the the death of the heart. Right? Use zaka. Right? Some of their intellect goes. Right? So with the with with too much studying. Right? The intellect goes, meaning that because they're memorizing too much or they're just on their books too much, they cannot, they cannot think critically anymore. And that's going on in Singapore. Like, it's very obvious. Right? That's why they keep trying to like, less, what do you call it now? I don't know what to call it. Teach less, learn more, but I don't know what they're doing about it. Eh? <laughs> like what's going on? Eh? Like, but it's, it's really like, it's manifest. What, he said, what Imam Ghazali said here, you know, a thousand years ago, is manifesting right now today. Right, too much studying right, is causing our kids to have no integrity, right, no compassion, no mercy. Right? I mean, all the traits, the good traits are all gone. Right? Because why? It's all about the marks. Right? Don't have that for your child. Intellectual preservation, we wrote before, right, the goals of intellectual preservation. You want your child to love studying. Right? Don't be focused on the grades. So don't be supposed to, I won't even say so much. Don't, just don't be. Focus on the grades, right? Focus them on learning and appreciating what they're learning, right? So if you can hold the affair of teaching your child, hold the affair of teaching your child, even if they are in school, you hold the affair of them learning. That means like, like my mom used to do that. And we used to go to school, we come back, but she would hold the affair. I mean, she would explain things to us, right? So even when I was growing up, uh, even religion, it was all at her hands. Right? She was the one who explained religion to us. My grandmother explained it to her. So she learned religion from my grandmother and, and, and she taught it to us. Right? So from there, she, can, she understands how we think. So instead of sending us to you know, other people to study from, she knows exactly what's going on in our minds when it comes to our worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from there, she can guide. Right? And from there, if we do fall into sin, 
right? And Judy, she will find out. I know how come she always finds out, right? And she, I say, them doa mustajab or something is going on. But she will always find out. Whenever we do anything, you know, secretly, she will always find out. And she won't even, like, be snooping or whatsoever. She will just come across. That kind of thing, you know, like magic. Uh. <laughs> or she like, you know. But basically, you know, she will just, in her way, if she finds out anything, she will actually bring us to her room, one-on-one, right? and she will just talk to us. That's it. Right? And, and she will say, I know that you know, right? and I know probably you had your reasons, right? but you know, just, just be aware that, that, that there is repentance, that is this, that is that whatsoever. Right? So she, she will actually do a one-on-one talk, and that was it. Right and alhamdulillah, right that was the method, right. So so in a sense, it, like that like you you go into your child, right. Wa ba'da lubi, right. And lub lub is basically inner sight, right. So they will lose inner sight. That right? means wisdom, right. Uh, the beauty inside, right. So when I see like my teacher says, so, you know, like she's full of wisdom, right. And where does this wisdom come from? Right? It comes from you know the the, the upbringing that she had, right. Her her, her husband is one lot. If you we all never sit with her husband, eh. When I say for husbands, one Allah, and he was teaching us, I mean, Habib Hashim, he has a lub. It's called lub. Like, he has a lub that is so deep. Like, inside that is like, you know, it's amazing. Right? Deep inside into matters. Right? So, when you ask a question and he answers, you're like, like, you know, like, you won't even see the answer being that way. Right? But these are people, basically, it's called, you know, like, knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah sends down. Right? Why? Because, first and foremost, they are connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their light. Right, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, in these it, entire things, they focus us on knowledge. What is knowledge? I right, don't lose sight. I right, don't lose sight. I don't think, you know, focusing on PSLE, O levels, A levels. Right, that is by the sight. You know, you can train them up on that, right, but don't lose sight on what is the point of knowledge. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised knowledge. Uh, it's high if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So, you know, for it to be that high if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm very sure it's not PSLE or levels, levels. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has reached it so high in the Quran. And Allah swears by the pen. Right? Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah speaks so many hadith about the ulama, right? those who have knowledge. Right? Who are these people who have knowledge? And Imam Shafi'i, right? he says that knowledge is not, basically, it's not what is memorized from books, but knowledge is rather what is a lightness in the heart. Right, that brings you to God. Right? It's, a, it's a guiding light that's in the heart. Right? So when they, when, they are getting, when, they want, when you want them to get this knowledge properly, right, it has to be interlaced with rawh. Right? Rawh qalb. Right? It has to be interlaced with, with, uh, with rest. Right? Rest of the heart. Right? And here, Rasulullah s.a.w. Right? There is uh, Muhammad. There was this, even, even in animals, eh? there's a story of Rasulullah s.a.w. There was a camel once, whereby this camel was a... It's kind of like, like, you know, wild camels, right? So, and everybody was afraid of this camel because it would, it, would, it would really, like, it would attack anybody who would come near. So, Rasulullah was once walking past this camel and he saw the camel, right? And, in the, and Rasulullah went to the camel. People were saying, yeah, Rasulullah, don't go to the camel. It's a crazy camel. Right? It's like a rabbit camel, like, in a way. Like, it was, it's going to hurt anybody who comes near him, right? So, so Rasulullah said, no, 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 no. I, I, I see there's something going on with this camel. He went to the camel. So when he went to the camel, right, the camel saw him and the camel came to him. Right, and he began to whisper in Rasulullah's ears. Right, and especially that the camel also began to cry lah, to Rasulullah as a complaint to Rasulullah. Right, and then Rasulullah, uh, thereafter, he called for the owner of the camel. Right, and then the owner was called. Right, and then the, uh, Rasulullah said, the camel has complained to me right, that you do not give him, you, you overload him and you don't give him enough to eat and drink. Right, so Rasulullah said to the, to the owner, you know, don't overwork him and give him enough food and drink, because he has a right over you. He's your beast. Right? So, and the, the man, he said the camel free, like, basically. Right? So here, the, the Hababa, when she told the story, she said that, you know, if this is on a camel, the Rasulullah has instructed a man not to overload a camel, then who are we overloading our children? Right? You know, why, why are we, you know, we're treating them as if they're, they're, they're worse than animals. Like, overloading them, you know, from, from, from what they, 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 they can't handle. Right? So see, see them, you know, be more aware right, of their... Of their um, Mental exhaustion. Right? Let them rest, you know, when they are when they are tired. Right? So here Rasulullah he says that, you know, Ahabul Amali Lallahi Adawa Muha in Qal. Right. So Rasulullah he says that the, the most beloved of deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala right, is the one that is consistent. Right? And for it to be consistent, start small. Right? Start small on your child. Right? For it to be consistent. Right? And especially I mentioned before and I'll mention it again, right? Especially when it comes to Quran memorization, 
Like even Sudah Zainab, she she herself told me lah. She was said that, she said that you know her, her her oldest son, right? She forced her oldest son on memorizing the Quran. Right? She basically forced him on it because he was very smart boy, very intelligent, very bright, very smart boy. She put him on memorizing the Quran. Right? But she said, but now he's all grown. He's twenty five. Right, he's in the university. He wants to pursue medicine. He wants to pursue to pursue that. Right, and she's like, you know, and I don't know where his muraja is. Right, where is his, you know, his 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 revision of Quran? Right, but she forced him on it. Right, so now she's she told me herself that she's feeling, you know, she's feeling it. Right, that, why did I force him to do it? So now he has other interests. Right, so is he going to revise? But he said, insha Allah, he will come back, and insha Allah, he will, you know, force himself to revise. Right, but I'm telling you from my own experience, it's not easy. Right, it's not easy when you, when, you, when you get into life and you get into motherhood, you get into all those things. To revise what you have memorized is not easy unless you have uh, been accustomed to it. Right, so be very careful about, about this Quran memorization. Let them push themselves. You be a support, but you don't be a push. Right, you be a support. Let them push themselves. Of course, if a school has their own syllabus, that's what they have to memorize. And Singapore, okay, like my opinion that Singapore madrasas, the amount they memorize is not much. To me lah, to me it's not much at all. It's not much at all. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, right? It's easy. It's easy. Eh? Like in Darul Zahra, we used to memorize three juz uh, per half year. Three juz half a year. Eh? <laughs> so when I learned that, you know, Marasa Sagov, they learned they memorize Surah Baqarah only, and they said four. I was like, whoa! I memorized that in the first semester of Darul Zahra, Surah Baqarah. <laughs> right? Because they push, they push in Darul Zahra, they push, 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 push. So by the time you finish four years. In Darul Zahra, you, you have memorized half the Quran. You know, half the Quran memorized. Right, so it's like, I don't know where it is now. Like, I'm doing my memory like that. <laughs> right, so for me, like, I'm trying my best. Right, but, but for me, I know in the Marasa system, it's okay. Right, how much they're the syllabus, it's okay. It's not a lot at all. It's not a lot. <laughs> Easy, eh? Right, and, and Hamdan, some Marasas, they go into Fadal al Suwar. They go into surahs that you repeat uh, constantly, which is good. Uh, you should be memorizing those as parents. You should be memorizing eh, Surah Yasin. If you have not memorized Surah Yasin, <laughs> try lah. If you don't have to memorize, if you don't want to. Right? But uh, if you're doing with your children, eh, Surah Waqia, Surah Muluk, Surah Dukhan, Surah Sajda. Right? If you're doing all of these surahs, if you're. The, surah Dukhan to be there every night. Yeah, I will, I'll be going into it in my tafsir, inshallah, of the surahs to be read every night. Surah Dukhan. In fact, in tarim, you want to know lah. Eh? In Tarim, they will read Surah after Maghrib. In the Sunnah Ba'diya, so the first two rakaats, they read Surah Yasin. Right? In the next two rakaats, Surah Dukhan, Surah Muluk. Right? <laughs> in the, the Sunnah, right? the Ba'diya after Maghrib. After Isha, in the Ba'diya, they will read again Muluk. They read two Muluks every night. Because it's too short. <laughs> so, <they read> two. <laughs> so they do two anyway. Yeah, I know. Like, Surah Mahzah Zainab, she's like, every morning she reads four Yasins. Because it's too short. So <laughs> they go four. <laughs> In one go, I was with her. She was sitting there. She was like, "Yeah, see, no Quran al Hakim, and yeah, see, no Quran al Hakim, yeah, see, no." I was like, "Sister, four times." She just read it. Adi, <laughs> morning, evening, four times, four times, eight times a day. Like, these are people like, okay, don't copy that, don't copy it. <laughs> like, because then, them is easy. It's easy, you know. But inshallah, may Allah help us. Like, Allah knows our state, sir. Eh? Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, and then Rasulullah said in the hadith. Inna li nafsika alayka haqq wa li ahlika alayka haqqan wa fa'ati kulla di haqqin haqqahu right for surely yourself has a right over you and for surely your family has a right over you so give each of those who have rights their right right yourself has a right right so if you're exhausting yourself and this is what she kept you know nagging me about if you're exhausting yourself you are you know it's called khiana right you are basically being you're treacherous against yourself Right, it's treachery against yourself. If you are, you know, not giving your child their rights, and the rights of the child is that they need to rest. Right, it is part of ch- of childhood to play, right, and outdoor play. In fact, part of childhood. Right, so you need to be able to uh, uh, give them that. Right? And, and it, it is haram. It is haram. It does go on haram. Right, that if you force a child, right, without allowing them to play, that means force, 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 force. It does go into haram. You know. Uh, to, 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 and, and if you kill their love for religion or you kill their love for studying, even more haram. Right? Because of how hard and, and severe you were on them, right? they have turned away right? from the religion. It's a very, it's a very like, you know, tricky situation eh, going on, eh? very difficult. 
right, for us to actually, but inshallah may Allah help us, right, uh, bring the, if, basically the bottom line, my teacher was telling me when I was talking to her about this, about more and more of our youth leaving the faith, right, and it's happening, you know, all over, all over Singapore, in Malaysia, Indonesia, it's everywhere, lah. it's everywhere, it's worldwide, so I was talking to her about it and she was like, it's basically, because I was talking about, talking to her about our event here about, you know, answering the unanswered because they have, you know, questions and all kind of things, and she said that, you know, while you answer their questions, I right, understand that their questions are just basically on the surface, right? There's a deeper problem that's going on, and the deeper problem is no connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the problem, right? So, with knowledge, connection. With play, connection to you, right? As, as the guide, right? In, in their life, right? Right, and here, right, and, and it could be that pressure on the child, right? It will... Diminish their intellect And bring them into a stupidity right? And if you've taught enough students right? I mean tuition If you've taught enough students You can see this right? That means too much Memorization Too much drilling right? It does destroy our students' ability To think creatively It does You can see it You can see it right? I know like, like I was talking to you about it and that, that I never finished a TYS in my life Ever like my mom never put force on it. Like it was not something that we did. Right. So basically and I know my students, there's teachers who tell them you must finish your TYS three times around. Right? Three times go. I was like, since when? You have to finish your TYS three times three times, three times you know, uh, over and over again. You don't have to. Right? If you know it, you know it. Finish. <laughs> right. I mean if you don't know it, then figure out more questions of that type. Right? Don't just do things randomly. Right? That would remove your intellect. Right, if you want to preserve the intellect, right, think, right, think. Right, I get very annoyed with students who they just want to get the answer. They don't want to go through the thought process. It, it gets on my nerves. I get so annoyed. Right, whenever they just want to know what is the answer, what is the answer, what is the answer, and then copy the, 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 uh, the steps. Right? I get very, very annoyed right, because you're not using your intellect at all. No intellect whatsoever. You're going to copy the method and then cut and paste into every question. The moment the question is changed, that's it. You get zero. Right, that is the call. What he's saying here, they're not allowed to think. I right? sit there in front of me. I don't care one hour. Sit there and think. Use your brains, like inshallah. Right. So I mean, alhamdulillah, may Allah make it easy on us. <laughs> right. So, so, so here he says, right. So, if I, if I, so this child, he will, he will always be asking to play. Right. So as a as a parent, and I mean Habib Tahir, he mentioned this before, and I was I thought it was a very good uh, point that a child who always likes to play. Right, so now you have an, an, an another extreme. Eh? But this one study at all. Wants to play, 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 play. Right? Okay, so go to extremes. Like one, the parent is completely like it's kind of helicopter parents and like, you know, making the child like hard, you know, hard uh, iron fist parents there. Eh? Like study all the time. On the other hand, you have children, they don't want to study at all. And there's something you can do to make them study. <laughs> right? They just want to play the whole day. Right? So what do you do? Habib Tahir said, I Habib Tahir when he was teaching this, he said that okay, if you can at this situation. Because this child, he's, you know, doesn't want to study at all, right? So if you can, right, you need to try your best right, to strike deals. Now the child is on a deal. You must strike deals with the child, right? And when you strike deals, you stick to your deals, right? So that means you put aside specific times, right, for play and for study, right? So if now we play, right, agree with me, later we will study, Right, that means, and, and you stick to your deal and you, he sticks to your deal. It can be hard, it can be hard, right, but that is a good step. It's the first step, right, to have specific timings. And he said that if you have a child who's always, you know, bothering you, right, while you are working, right, then you need to put aside a time, right, for you to be with that child. So the child understands that, okay, when the time is like that, then it's my time with you, that kind of thing. So they won't always be bothering you. Right, because they know it's after time is eh, time is eh. We're not talking about like babies eh. <laughs> babies they don't care about timing. <laughs> right, after after time is you know when there is a time uh, there's timing. Right, and of course they you have you must you must at this age for your child have a proper timetable, proper timetabling. Right, and every alim of the past, right, every scholar, Imam Ghazali, Imam Shafi, Imam Nawawi. Every scholar of the past, even Habib Abdul Rahman Sagaf, right, all the Hadrams, all of them, they have timetables. All. Right? So if you're living your day, even your own life, eh, if you have no timetable, 
right, basically, right, then you're basically not making the most of your time. Right, of course, timetabling, especially with babies, right, have like, you know, like leeways. Lah. But timetable, by when must they sleep? Right, and be strict about it. Right, by when must they wake up? And be strict about it. Right, so basically, timetabling will do a lot of, it will do you a favor and your child a favor when you learn how to, when you learn how to do timetable. My mother, when we were growing up, she would always timetable for us. Always. We were on a strict timetable from the time we go back from school to the time we sleep. It was a strict timetable. Right, so every day, right, come back from school, have lunch, right, do homework. It's understood. Right, and then sleep. Right, Zuhur and then sleep. And then wake up, go to the park, play. Right, 5 to 7, play. Come back, right, Maghrib, study for one hour, until nine, sleep. Right, standard. That was it. The whole, all seven of us, she had seven of us, eh? right, one, uh, one after another. So, so all of us were on the same timetable. Right, and that was how she implemented. That was it. Right, so it's, it's, you know, have and let your child understand timetabling. Right, so if you can have a chart, right, that is not words, if you want, if you want, you can put pictures. Right, so when the clock is like that, right, so this time for what? And you put a picture there. Right, so they, they understand timetabling for so you can maximize them and you can you can help them lah. So if they want to play, say you see, when the clock is like that, then it's time to play. Right? So even if they can't read the time, they can see the clock like what? Like it's got big clocks with the numbers, eh? So you can put the pictures, you know, uh, accordingly. So they, they can tell themselves right, that it's time to okay, now it's time to actually uh, read Quran, that kind of thing. Right? It will do them a big favor. And if you don't if you're not on a timetable, then be on a timetable, please. Right. You need to actually write down a timetable for yourself. Okay? We sing a lot. I know I know of one Habib in Tarim, subhanAllah, his wife was telling me, because he passed away suddenly. Right. He was a young man. Right. His wife is one of my teachers lah, in Tarim. She's old now. Lah. So she said that he just came home one day. She they went to have their like Kalula, their afternoon nap, and he passed away. Very very simple death. That was it. Right. So she woke up, she like, I think that's my biggest fear <laughs> To wake up and find your husband dead next to you <laughs> and Basically she woke up And she found her husband dead next to her like, He died in his sleep In the afternoon, in the broad daylight right? So she and I, I, I said to her like, What do you do? Then she was like, like You know at that point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He sends down a strength That you never know you could ever have right? I just got up I said in the region I covered his face I went out I called the kids And I told them Right. And, and she said, I have no idea what kept me, what kept me together. <laughs> right. So basically, her husband, right, uh, he, was a, he was a writer. It means penmanship. Right. He, would, he was a scribe, or you call it a scribe. Right. And he was a painter, and he was a teacher in Nahu, right. and he was a teacher in one of the schools. Right. So he had a lot of things that he was doing, and he would read Quran four times a day. Right, so he had a Quran that he would read, that he would khatam every three days. There was a Quran that he would read, whereby he would ponder over. There's a Quran that he would read, you know, in a in a moderate pace. And there's a Quran that he would read to memorize. Right, so basically, so so she said to me that his day is so structured that if he was he's meant to do his scribing, right, his writing, and he had beautiful penmanship, so he would scribe. So like, if it ended at the hour, even if he had one more work to do, he will not do it. He will stop. And go on to the next activity. They are full of discipline, like discipline, discipline. Right? So time with the children, time with the children, time with the with the with the school, time with the school, time with the Quran, with the Quran, that kind of thing. So and he accomplished so much. Right? She would show me all the books that he wrote by hand, right? and how many portraits that he actually painted while painting. Right? And at the same time, he was in the school, in the school, right? uh, teaching. Right? So she showed me how much he actually accomplished by timetabling. Right? And this is the secrets of of the scholars of the past: timetabling. Right, timetabling will allow you to achieve much more. Right? There's a, there'll be blessing in your time when you timetable. Right? So, and I'm sure we know, eh? We know all about timetabling, eh? Right? I know in Darul Zahra, four periods every day. Right? And we learned so much right, in that four periods by timetabling. Right? So then he says here, right, so this is what they... فَرِفْقُ فِي كُلِّ الْأُمُورِ أَحْسَنُ قَالُوا بِذَا وَصَرَّحُ أَوْ بَيَّنُ Right and to and to be gentle. This is from a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. To be gentle in every affair is the best way. It means gentleness in all affairs is the best way, right? and that is the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And in a hadith, Rasulullah uh, Sayyidina Aisha said that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he was not shown two ways, except that he chose the easier of it. He always chose the easier of two ways. You know, I mean, consider that both ways are halal. 
Right? So both is are halal. He will always choose what is easier. Right? So for your children, for yourself, for your family, right? keep it easy, keep it light. Right? You don't want to turn them off. Right? That is the worst thing that you could do is to turn them off of this religion. So even when it comes to hijab, when it comes to hijab, right? so you know, encourage them on it. Right, you know, beautiful words. They want to wear pretty hijabs, and wear their pretty hijabs, right? Don't like, no, 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 it has to be black. No, 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 it has to be, you know, like, okay, I wear black lah, you know, like, but, but you don't have to, like, force it on the girls, their baby little girls, right? So they want to have pretty frills, whatever, pakai lah, eh? <laughs> right? If they want to have, like, whatever, I don't know lah what the girls today want to do, right? But if they want to, if it helps them, as they grow older, they'll grow more mature. They will grow more mature as they grow older, right? But now, you know, with the love, Right, and the gentleness, let them have what they want to have. Right? But not to compromise the religion. Right? So if they want to wear sleeveless, okay, okay, no, 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 no. Right, let's have some sleeves. Right? It's nice to have sleeves. Right? Right, so in, in, in a way, right, but, but nicely, right, don't scold them about it. Right? They're still below the age of puberty. Right? Don't scold them about it. Let's just be nice about things. Right? So here, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right, he said, and there are a lot of you know hadiths about it. He said that makana rifku fi shayin illa zana wa wala kana al unfu fi shayin illa shana. Right? And he says Rasulullah Sallam he says in the hadith that gentleness does not enter any any matter except that it beautifies it. So whenever any time gentleness enters into a matter, it will be beautiful. Right? And 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 harshness does not enter a matter except that it makes it ugly. Right, it you know it 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 it, uh, it foils it. Right, it makes it ugly. Right, so in in parenting, in speech, in everything lah. Right, gentleness. It is the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He was not somebody to be who was known to be to be have a sharp tongue, at all. He ne- he did not have a sharp tongue against children, women, people, ever. You will not find a single hadith whereby Rasulullah sallam was sharp tongued, ever. Right, but he will always you know educate. He would understand, especially if it was someone who did not know better. Right? So when the Bedouin came, and we know the story of the Bedouin who uh, united in the mosque. Right? We know the story. Right? And he was gentle on the Bedouin because he knew the background was what? The background was that he was from the desert. So our kids was the background. Nothing. They don't know anything. <laughs> they're coming into this world blur. Right? So you know, we don't treat them as if they're adults. They're children. They don't know a lot of things. Right? So to have the eye of... Mercy on them, even after Tamis, they are still learning. Right. Right. So, and then he says, So, وَبَعْدَمَا يُشْرِكُ نُورُ الْأَقْلِ عَلَى صَبِي يُؤْمَرُ and يُصَلْنِ Right. So, now we're going to go to Sharia. Right. So, here, right, the first part about the Quran. Right. Tamam. So, and it said that some of the scholars have said that husnul uh, inqiyad lima yu'addi ilal jameel. Right? So, and, and, and subhanAllah, the people of the past, right? And when Salah Zainab, she was telling me many, many times, right? That it is, you know, it is how you present something. Right? It's how you present something to someone, right? That determines if they will accept it or reject it. Right? Usually, it's how you present Right, so you could present to someone something that is completely false. But because of the beauty of your presentation, which what they have done. Right, they have presented to us all kinds of foul things. But because it's beautiful, it's beautified, people accept. Right? And on the other hand, you know, unfortunately, even though Islam is beautiful in itself, you don't have to beautify Islam, it's beautiful in itself. But we uglify it. Right? So when you uglify it, then people turn run away. Right? They, they turn away and they, and they run away. Right, so it is, it is on us to actually, you know, give it its right. right. In the way we present these knowledges to our children, studying to our children. Right, if you see them getting tired, don't be afraid to stop. Right, don't be, don't, 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 you must finish it or what, don't be afraid to stop. Stop. Right, continue later on. Right, same thing with food. If you see them not able to finish, stop, keep. Right, later, you can finish it. Right, but don't throw. Don't throw. Right, you know, my teacher says so up, she was like she was she was asking me because they never throw food. They never ever throw food. So when they came here, people keep feeding them. So they have like piles of food in their fridge because they keep keeping it. Because they never throw food. Because in Tarim, at the most, right, they will give to the poor who are around. You know, they actually give food to the poor, right? Or you know, at very, very most, they will give it to the goats. So the goats will eat it. 
Uh, but in Singapore, what do you do? Throw. Uh, we throw food. So she was telling me that, you know, give it to the guard. <laughs> and I was like, give it to the guard? <laughs> It's a bit weird in Singapore <laughs> for you to give leftovers to the guy right downstairs. She said, at the, at, the, at the condo entrance, like, give it to the guy. I said, I can try. <laughs> right, but basically, they, because that's, that's the way they are. Right? When it comes to food, when it comes to education, when it comes to, there's a lot of leniency, right? And a lot of, um, you know, gentleness, but a lot of talk also. A lot of talk also. Right? And that, alhamdulillah, I do believe that that will bring a child Right, to by himself, he will want to study more. He will. Right? And when it comes to play also, you know, they love to play, but it's only so much you can play if it's natural play. Right? If it's unnatural play, they can do it all day. That means when it comes to video gaming and whatever, they can do it all day. Right? Because it's unnatural, it's addictive. Right? But when it comes to natural play, like even football, right? they will play football, the boys will play football, then it's too hot. <laughs> they'll come in, right? I mean, they have to give up <laughs> sooner or later. It's too, it's too, it's too tiring. Right? I mean, I know my husband said that when he was young, he would play football morning, evening, night. Right? But then he would still study right, in between, right? In a in a way lah. Like, but it would just help him. All right. So now we are going into the fiqh, right? Because yeah. They want to study. Uh, <laughs> then it's okay. Let's give. Also Give. Yeah, yeah. It's because the the thing is that you don't want to. The, the what he's saying here is not to force. Uh, if they want, then take ah. <laughs> right, but if they say they say no, I'm tired. I don't do anymore. Mother, you're tired. <laughs> Mother, you're tired. <laughs> then like like automated ah, automated. Oh, it's Color yourself, mark yourself. <laughs> I don't to go through with you. <laughs> Right, but how many like? But it's, it's, if they're asking for it, then it's good lah. Find this kind of. But that will not lead to that um... No, this one is only when it's forced. Okay. Right, you mean you're forcing them and they hate it. And right, so the mountain kalbi is that they just hate knowledge. Okay, if it reaches that stage, right, they become addicted. So how do you reverse? Uh, how do you repair the heart? Okay, if it has reached that stage for some children, right, the reversing would be a lot. It will be dependent on the teacher. The teacher needs to reverse. Alright, so like, like, like alhamdulillah, like I have met people who they were turned off of the religion like completely, completely turned off. Right? So what they need is someone take them by the hand and explain to them the deeper meanings of this religion. You know, because probably at this age, they're probably a bit older. Right? So someone to actually re-teach them. That means they have to start all over again. Right, with somebody different, right, who is able to do this with them. Right, and inshallah, they will start to see the beauty in this religion that they have never seen before. Right, and they will understand that what they have had or previously is actually not what it is. Right, so, but it does depend a lot on the teacher. The teacher plays a very big role. Right, even when it comes to non-religious sciences like chemistry, maths, you know, history whatsoever, the teacher plays a very big role. Eh? Right, how, like how we used to love or hate the subject can be very much dependent on the teacher. A right, teacher does right, so so that's why you know if you can, you are a teacher lah. Right, so you hold it to yourself. If you can't be a the teacher, then find somebody who can, right, be a good teacher for them, right? Because I know, like for me, like I, I like like of of the subjects that I used to really really dislike dislike, right, is because the teacher right was just un. I, I don't want to say what, what teacher lah, basically, but he was not lovable very much lah. Okay. <laughs> Right, so just, that the whole class would not like the subject at all. But it's a beautiful subject. Right, but the teacher completely destroyed it. Change teacher. You get a good teacher. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Allah. And teachers, they hold, they hold a lot of amana, eh? a lot of responsibilities on teachers. Right? Because you shape the, the view of a child. Right? And sometimes, you know, as mentioned so before, that sometimes a child, they work hard for a subject only because they like a teacher that's there. They like the teacher. Right, so they work hard for it because of the teacher. Right? And that is how we are with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is our ultimate teacher. Right? Sometimes we go deep into this, into, into our religion, into our worship, into our whatsoever, because we want to get to him. Right? We want to get close to our teacher. And we want our teacher to be proud of us, of what we are doing. That's right? so, why you know, at the end of, our, of every lesson, I will say in, in the Fatiha that I read, at the end of the lesson, that, that you know that, Mi Allah al-Fatiha al-Allah al-Fatiha, Anna Allah al-Zukana al-Man-Nafi' wa amal al-Khawais al-Maqbul, 
right? So may, may Allah, you know, Fatiha, that Allah gives us, you know, knowledge that is beneficial, right? And, uh, and, 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 and gives us a beautiful way of studying and teaching, right? Yasurru bidhalika qalban nabi. Right, that from from this way of our our learning and teaching, the the heart of Rasulullah Sallam is brought into joy. Right? It gives him so much joy that he sees this kind of you know uh, uh, circles whereby we are learning and studying. And that is the fatiha from Abu Omar. Right? He gives us the fatiha to read after every lesson, right? So that you know, inshallah, you achieve right the joy of our teacher lah. Right? Because sometimes the teachers you see, when, as teachers like, you see your students studying and then they are they are, they are, they are, they are, they are so enthusiastic about it you know it brings a coolness to your eyes to your heart right so what more rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam he is the ultimate teacher right he has taught all of this to us right so when he sees that you know it's not being forgotten it's not being neglected it's not being, it's being brought back right he you know how happy he is in his grief right that he's seeing that his ummah is on this right? and and as well no, when you bring this to your tell your, tell your, tell your children you know, tell them right tell them rasulullah is very happy Right, that you are, you know, you, that you love your your Quran. He's very happy about this. Let them also joy. You know, let, let, let them you know have the joy of of this of 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 knowing that Rasulullah SAW is seeing us. Right? Okay. <laughs> it's a good sign that she likes to study. <laughs> oh, second also suka. It's a good thing. You should like, alhamdulillah, like some <laughs> parents are like pulling their hair out <laughs> about it. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Right, Masayna uh, Muhammad. Okay. So, right, and here, Hababa, subhanAllah, just, just in time for your question, eh? a person lives according to what they have learned. Right, that means that is to know exactly what your child has learned. See how he lives. Because you could have memorized a lot, but you have not learned. Right? And just today, you know, we had a class this morning, like one of the institutions, right, whereby the students kept complaining right, that the teacher you know, would repeat uh, the subject, you know, would repeat f- from previous lessons. Right? And there is actually a sunnah. To actually repeat the previous lesson is a sunnah. Right, but the students, because they are uh, like, they're like, no, we did this before, don't learn again, that kind of thing. You know, like they, they, would, they would complain about this, right? And then I just said to them, okay, you know what? If you have learned it before, can I test you? Right. <laughs> Straight away, no. <laughs> Why? Because you don't know it. Right? If you know it, it's on your fingertips. If you know it, it's in your life. Right? And that day I was talking to my husband about transition now, when you translate somebody. And he said that it's important that the translator, you know the subject. Right, because the, the Sheikh or the Habib or the Ustazah, right, they quote du'as randomly. And that day, the, the, the Habib was quoting uh, you know, du'a of, you know, of, 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 of leaving the house you know, in, in Betul Hidayah. Right, so, and the translator had no idea what the du'a. So he had to ask the Habib one by one, the, the, you know, every word. And then, then it became clear that the translator is not, not somebody who goes out of the house and reads his du'a. Right, because if you did, you would have memorized it. Right, so it's a bit like, embarrassing lah as a translator. Like if you, if the, if the, if like Ustazah, she always quotes things. Like, Alhamdulillah, I know it, <laughs> so I don't have to like you know keep asking her about it. But some I, I don't know, so I have to ask her. But it shows how much knowledge I have taken. Right, that is not you know. So basically, you live according to what you have learned. Right? And if you are not living according to what you have learned, then you have not learned it. Right? You have not learned it at all. Right? Even if you say, so even was in Muhammad. Right. So وَبَعْدَ مَا يُشْرِقُكُ نُورُ الْعَقْلِ عَلَى صَبِي يُؤْمَرُ أَنْ يُصَلِّي right, So now we are going into the uh, topic of fiqh. Right, introducing fiqh into their lives. Right, so you see how much work is done right, before you actually bring fiqh in. Right, because if you bring fiqh in from the very beginning without all this work, that is when you, re- when you will be faced with rebellion. Right, people who will hate the prayer, they will hate fasting, they will hate the hijab, they will hate all the laws of Islam. Right, because of the lack of you know, introduction. Right, some of us, we were forced into it, but as we grew up, we figured it out. And right, we learned more about it and we, we, we began to appreciate it. Right, but of course, it would be nicer if from the beginning, right, it was explained to them. Right? And so when they enter into it, right, they enter it wholeheartedly, inshallah. Right. So here he says, so now when the light of the, of the intellect is now shining on the child, right, clear on the child, light shining on the child, so now you are going to to command the child to the prayer, right? And they say, and Imam Ghazali says here, you know that just with the prayer, you are going to command the child with all other matters of the religion. So not just the prayer, 
And of course, tahara, right? If, when it comes to wudu and istinja. And Hababa Maryam, she says that you make sure you observe your child at the age of five, four, five, you know, when they are already toilet trained. You observe them how they istinja. Make sure that they're doing it well, correctly. You don't want them to walking around with, you know, drops of uh, nudges on their clothing, eh? Right? And then uh, uh, wudu, right? Check them again at tamis, check their wudu. At balil, check their wudu again. And you must be checking their wudu. Are they doing it well? Right? What is, and you go and find out what is the sunnah of wudu? What is the worship of wudu? How do you wash your face in wudu? Where is the niyat when it comes to wudu? Like about the hand and whatsoever, the head and all that. You must find out. Like go learn your fardu ayn. You know, and in, 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 in tari, we learn fardu ayn over and over and over and over again. Right? You don't say you learn it one time and you're, and you're done. No. Right here, you know, the, the, this morning, nah, the, <laughs> our students, right, they learn a fake book. Then learn another fake book. And every fake book will repeat the first fake book. And that is the way we learn. So that your fake is at your fingertips. So anything happens to you in life, you know what's the hukum. You can't like, oh, wait, 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 I'm going to go and find my book and go and find out what's the hukum. No, you must know the hukum on, on your fingertips. Right? So when they complain, I was like, okay, we need to give them a pep talk. <laughs> like the students, you know, like, if you want to complain, you're like, we have to, you know, tell you all that you repeat the same thing over and over again, especially affairs of your religion. You learn it over and over again so that you know what you're doing. Right? So it, um, Check their wudu, right? And Imam Ghazali says, also command them to pray, eh, to, 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 to fast. Fast. Right? Command them to the fasting if they are able to. Again, rifq. Right? You need to have leniency and gentleness, but don't let go of the affair altogether. Right? That means tell them, okay, you know what, tomorrow's Ramadan, we're all going to fast, right? Can you, you want to promise me? You know, from what time to what time? That kind of thing. Let them hold, the, let them hold some responsibility. So, okay, we promise from 9 to, you know, from time I wake up, for example. You know, and some kids, they start that, that way. They wake up, they have their breakfast, and then they fast. Right? So, you can start that way. You know, so they have to have sahur if you don't want to. Right? Some kids, they want to have sahur. Up to them. You know, like half day fasting and, and, and so on, right? So, you can basically be, you can be gentle about it. Or, and I had a friend who would, basically, she would reward them. Right? So, whoever would fast the whole day, right, would get $1. You know, literally money we want. And it's, it's okay, it's fine. Right? You can begin them up because they're children. Right? So you can you don't have to like, you know, it's all in the akhirat, it's all in, in paradise. Or it is. Right? They do get rewards in paradise. But I'm giving you some reward now here in this world. Right? You can do that. Right? So you know, whoever fasts the whole day, they will get to choose what dessert for you know to buy or whatever. Lah. Right? Find 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 ways whereby you can uh, reward them. Right? And I know like like kids who they will fast the whole day because if you fast the whole day, you get one dollar, right? So they want the one dollar, <laughs> right? So they fast. If you fast half day, they you get fifty cents. That kind of thing, whatever they are able to, right? But you know, just just allow them, right? Allow them to uh, to go into this, right? And then uh, and also haram things. So at tamis, at tamis for boys especially, right? Uh, try to enforce right, the covering of the aura from the navel to the knee, right? Enforce in the home. Right, in the home, of course, out of the home. Right, in and out of the home, navel to the knee, that is your aura. Right? Right, I mean, I, I don't know, lah, but it's, it's something that is prevalent in society. Eh? That people in the home, right, even adults in the home, they wear shorts. Right, you're not supposed to wear shorts in front of anybody. <laughs> even your own family members, except for your spouse. Right? And even that, it's a khilaf right, about that. Right? So you're not supposed to wear... Because I, I went to my friends' houses... Right, and, and they are like people who wear the hijab outside of the house. But in the house, they're wearing shorts. And I felt very like, uncomfortable. <laughs> I want you wearing shorts in your house. Like your mother is there, your father is there, your brother is there. Right, but it's just they're used to it. So the brother also wears shorts in the house. And right, the father also wears shorts in the house. Right, because it's in the house. Right, no, it's all right, it's all right. right. So at seven years old, if you can from before, but if not, then after seven, right, try to train your, your boys. And I remember my mother... Right, that she would, uh, we used to wear, I think when I was young, we used to wear tights. You know, baby girls lah, they wear tights kan. Yeah. So I remember that she, I remember where, that she actually cleared our cupboards of all the tights and bought baggy pants. Yeah. And then we were seven. And we were actually seven years old. Because right? she cleared everything out. Right? And then she, and she would, my mother would never buy for us Barbie dolls. Yeah. Ever. Right? Because she, why? She has five boys in the house. Right? She has five sons. Right, Barbie dolls are not a good idea when you have five sons. <laughs> right, because they lose their clothes, you know. Like, <laughs> you know, not they lose their clothes, like we lose their clothes. Right? Right, but, but so I always wondered when I was growing up, all my friends had it. 
I buy my mother would never buy. She would buy for me sort of bean dolls, <laughs> like beanie dolls, with no body parts whatsoever. They're just sacks of beans with, you know, a head and like, you know, it's kind of like SpongeBob kind of thing. <laughs> I said, no, no body parts at all. Because why? She was watching over her sons. Right? She doesn't want her sons to be able to see dolls that has body parts. Right? So, and we are like, not aware. And for me, I've seen my own students, you know, when I was in, you know, I was teaching now, and that my own, my own friends, boys, right, who were at the age of like 11 and, at that time, 11 and 12, right, they came to one of the friends' houses, lah, and there was a baby doll there that was unclothed, right, and they were like pointing and laughing, right, and they were like, you know, like doing stuff, lah, with the doll, right, and they were 10 year old, 11 year old, right, straight away I told my friend, your sons, you know, are doing things that are inappropriate, the Barbie doll. Right? I mean, basically, basically. Right? I mean, you have to be honest about it. Ah. Yeah. Right? So just don't, don't, don't be blur parents. Eh? <laughs> don't be naive parents. Right? Don't let this kind of filth enter your home. Especially if you have boys. Right? At all. At all. Right? <laughs> My, but then in Tarim, they're so, they're, they're so innocent. Eh? <laughs> so Zarina was telling me how innocent her son was. Because her son is 12 years old. And she was like, you know, let him, you know, uh, like, like sleep in the same room as, as me. Like, because I was sitting by myself and I was like, you know, like I want her to sleep with me. Or whatever, whatever. So she was like, let Ali sleep with you. Lah. Then I said, oh, Ali is chill. I'm too shy with him. He's a small boy. Lah. He's a small boy. She was like, Ali, Ali doesn't know anything. He's so blur. He has no clue. He thinks that babies come from the knees. <laughs> like, they're, they're, just, they're so innocent. They, honestly, they're so innocent. Like, and she asked me, you know, that he ever... These are people who are so pure. They're so pure. That he, she told me that he just asked her. I'm like, Alhamdulillah. She just, he just asked her, like, why did Allah create his private parts? And then and she said, oh, for you to pee. <laughs> and then he was like, yeah, but he could put it into a hole. It's easy enough. <laughs> That's why it to be so long. Then she was like, hmm, no lah. Allah knows. <laughs> Because he's so innocent, he's 12 years old. I, I told her, you know, our, our boys at 12, they know more than what they should know. Right? But they're so pure. Her mother told me that she, her own nephew once walked in into a baby girl right, that was unclothed. Right? And he pointed at her and she was like, her thing spoiled. <laughs> because she's never seen a girl before in his life. <laughs> so he thought, harban, ha, the harban. That means rosa. <laughs> it's a girl. But this, that 12 year old, 12 year old, that means they've never seen anything in their life. They're so completely pure. Right? SubhanAllah, so, our children will be that kind of like pureness, pureness. And she herself told me that she didn't know anything about where babies came from until she got married. <laughs> then, like, surprise of her life, shock of her life, <laughs> she didn't know anything. SubhanAllah, so, they're just so pure, so pure. SubhanAllah. So, right? So. So, so to teach them, you know, what is haram and halal, right? So, you know, at the age of Tamiz, right, the haram things, eh, uh, on boys, right? So covering the aura, right, not allowing shots, right? Please be, be firm with your boys. It's only navel to knee, right? They don't have to compromise. I don't know why. I'm even really upset with the boys in my, in my house. Like, why must they compromise and wear above the knee? Why? Why? Like, we have to cover our whole bodies and we are fine with that. Right? But the boys just, like, it's like so hard for them to cover below the knees, Right, just wear a bit longer below the knees. Right? Um, and then about wearing uh, beautification for boys. Eh? For girls also, try to have more, you know, like their, their budget to be less tight, right? to more flowy, right? more decent. Right? Their toys, take care of their toys, what are they playing with? Right? As far as possible, stay away from human figures. Right? If they want dolls, Aina Aisha had dolls, but her dolls were basically bean bags. Right? So beanies are good enough. Right, they can play beanies all they want, right? But it doesn't have to be physical structures, right, of, of a human being, right? And then, uh, and he says that also, Masayna uh, Muhammad, and teach him also, Imam Ghazali says here, at, at this age, you know, teach them, right, everything that would, te- that would teach them how to respect the laws of the Sharia. It means explain to them the Sharia. Right, so they respect the laws of the Sharia. Right, so at this age, you're gonna to start to explain to them about interaction also, right? Interaction, right? What is appropriate, what's not appropriate, right? Uh, you know, uh, some scholars do say that up to the age of ten, right? But you just you're training them, 
right, to have not not to have inappropriate interaction with the other gender, right, uh, and then also, uh, and and to warn them, right, against against stealing, lying, backbiting, and all the terrible sins of the tongue. Uh, you're going to be start, you're going to start to warn them about them, right? Because it's you know it's one a lot. All of these things, right? He's going to be Balir soon, and you must keep in your mind that Balir happens at nine and up, right? Boys and girls, right? Boys and girls, it can happen nine and up, right? So don't think that it won't, won't happen to my child, but right? it could. We don't know because our our day is changing, right? We, our and, and and our children are becoming more sexually aware wow. at a younger age, so it's not you know. Uh, unthinkable that they will reach puberty at a younger age. It's not unthinkable, yeah. right? So just be prepared. The age of seven, they have two years to get their act together. <laughs> right? Nine years old is when ballet can happen, yeah. right? So nine years old, <laughs> it's too early. Right? But my cousin herself nine years old. I mean, like it's just the <laughs> magic. But she was prepared. Huh? <laughs> Right, well, but nine years old, eh? Nine years old for boys and for girls. And girls, when it comes to ballet, girls can also ballet through wet dreams, eh? If you all. Don't know that now you know, <laughs> right? Can, 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 right? If your girl does come to you and report to you something, right? And there's no menses, bye. Right? If if, if she's past nine years old, right? Boys and girls, both. You can go and check the books of it. It's all there. <laughs> it's all there, right? <clears throat> so now, right? With your and she says that you know and and make sure that your boys are not wearing any silk or gold. So Mama Kazali is saying like this, you know, no ornaments on your boys. Take care of your boys, eh? Right? And make them and train them on on the on the adhan in the iqama, seven years old, right? Because they can be imams. Now at mayis at tamis, right? Boys can be imams to their mothers, right? So and I met so many boys who are tamis who are not, you know, fit to be imams. They can, they can if their fatiha is fine, and they know how to pray well. They can be my imam. Right? Train your boys. At tamis, they can be your imam. Right? They don't have to be balir. Eh? It's just tamis. The, the condition is of imam is tamis. Right? Not balir. Right? So, uh, what's in Muhammad? Right? A lot more about boys in this, in this, in this uh, section. For... Right? And, and also against lying. Right? Be very, very harsh against lying at this age. Right? And when they are young, you know, they would lie. Right? Because it's the natural tendency of human being to lie. Right? It is our defense mechanism. Right? When things can go bad, we lie. Right? To protect ourselves. Right? So be very, very firm on this against lying. Right? Because they are at the age whereby they know lying is, 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 is wrong. Right? And they know that the consequence for lying will be more severe right, on them. Right, so basically, the laws come in, the haram and the and the wajib comes in. Right, all of it will come in for your child here. Yeah. Right, there's a lot more to say because Imam Ghazali he goes like really deep into fiqh. Right, so you see like, like you see like all the stories how about all right, the shirts everywhere thing. Right, about fiqh when it comes to this age. Right, so inshallah next week I will spend more time, right, to speak about this. Right, so that. Inshallah, when the time comes, we know how to handle. I hope that you are doing as I said for you all to do, eh? that you are writing it according to the age. Right? So when the child reaches his birthday, you can check the book. <laughs> okay, this year, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> right, how are we on this year? Right, so that you know where are they right, in, their, uh, in their progress towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the end of the day, right, your children are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are just trustees. Right? We do what we can. Right? But what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has written for them, Allah has written for them. Right, so we just do what we can as 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 guardians over them, lah. Right, and we just hope, inshallah we do all for the best for our children, <laughs> inshallah. Alhamdulillah. And one thing that Sada Zainab was telling me about is that, you know, it's children of people who are knowledgeable, they their children are their biggest tests. <laughs> their children are their biggest tests. Right, Allah will test them through their children. Right, that's where the test will come. So Allah, I mean, Allah make me, I mean, Allah be gentle on us, lah. Eh? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean. So Allah, Allah say, no more. Any questions?
entrance. <laughs> Yeah, like if you have to meet up to societal standards, then you have no choice. Yeah, right. But if you don't have to meet up to it, then you have a choice, lah. Right. So this is basically in their time whereby they would educate their own children, right. But so, but if you have to meet up to the set standards that is set by the madrasas, then you have to push, ah. There's no choice. <laughs> right, because I know even in Singapore primary schools, so it's it's still you know you they push, they push. Right, which is sad lah. So you need to just be very, you need to monitor your child a lot. Just monitor them a lot, and don't. And even while they are in the madrasa, because of the heaviness of the subjects and everything, monitor. Right, don't be a parent that, that goes on auto mode, whereby they are doing the school, they come back and they handle themselves. No, monitor their situation, their 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 emotional state, right, their mental state, their whatsoever. You know, you know Allah allow you to see. Then maybe even sometimes, sometimes you know, you make a lot of dua. That sometimes a small, like time in the day whereby you play, like that is enough for them. The half an hour je is enough for them. Sometimes it's good enough, right? Like, like how the ulama lah, they, they would they would pray the whole night and a half an hour of sleep is enough, right? So maybe it could be like like that. Yeah. <laughs> like there are a few hours of play. Yeah, just half an hour of play can already, right? Oh, you know, whatever lah. Inshallah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت استغفرك واتوب اليك سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك اشهد ان لا اله الا انت this is very interesting this is about uh, companionship friendship and companionship because they they're at the age lah they're going to look for friends so you're going to check their friends 